Okay, let's talk about some network security devices. And I've kind of laid out here kind of a sample network. There's more than one way to do this. Depends on what you're aiming for. But I want to walk you through some of this uh, kind of theoretical setup and some of the devices we can use in our network and uh, how they function. So in this scenario, I've got the internet connected to a firewall. And in here, I've got my DMZ. Now, your uh, notice I've got three connections coming into my firewall. So your firewall, just down here, firewall controls traffic in and out of your network. We're going to establish rules on the firewall. Uh, access control lists are the foundation of this and a lot of other types of network security. So access control lists say what's permitted, what's denied. Now, I've set this up so that... I've got some publicly accessible servers in here, email servers, web servers, something like that. I do not want those inside the main part of my network. I want them isolated. And the reason is I want to set a different set of rules for traffic coming through here than for traffic coming through here. Here, I want to be a little more restrictive because this is coming into my uh, main network. And so I want to be a little more restrictive. I don't want to allow email traffic or web traffic or whatever uh, traffic from the outside coming into my local network. So I'm going to put it in a DMZ. And so my firewall is going to allow me to set one level, one set of rules for things coming in here to my DMZ, another set of rules for things coming in here, which means I can be more restrictive for things coming into my uh, local area network. Now here in my DMZ, I have my uh, email servers. Remember, firewall controls traffic in and out. So I have my web and email servers, and we're controlling traffic to them. We're not allowing everything. We're only allowing what we absolutely have to. But you're going to see I've got another device here, which is my ESA or my email security appliance. You'll see that right here. So the purpose of the ESA is it monitors email for incoming potential threats. So it could be looking for spam. It could be looking for phishing. It could be looking for um, viruses that are being emailed in or malware of some kind. So lots of different things that we can set that ESA to look for. And this is a great tool. Now, this only comes into play if you are hosting your own email. So if you're using something like Office 365 or some other hosted solution for your organization's email, they should have their own ESAs. But if you are doing it yourself, investing in an ESA, probably a pretty good idea. So what you would do is you would set this as a destination for all of your, in your DNS, uh, you'd set this as a destination for all incoming email. So somebody on the internet goes to email you, the email comes to your ESA, your ESA scans it, and then forwards it to your email server. All right, so that's going to provide a fairly good level of protection. Now, no protection is perfect, but a fairly good level of protection. So let's take a look at this here. Uh, our local area network, I have an IPS or IDS. Now, this is intrusion prevention system or an intrusion detection system. It's not the same thing. So an IDS, I like to call it the mole cop. The IDS's job is to observe and report. So it doesn't actually do anything to stop an attack. It observes and reports on incoming uh, traffic, and it looks for either recognized attack patterns. Hey, this is something we've seen before. We know this is an attack. Um, or it can look for heuristics, look at traffic that looks unusual. Hey, we've had, we're having a ton of extra traffic. This might be an issue. Now, an IDS will analyze that, but its job is to observe and report. So if there is a challenge, then it notifies the uh, administrator normally through an email or something like that. An IPS is a little more aggressive. So this one will detect, this one will prevent. An IPS is more like the cop. It has some more authority to back it up. It carries a gun. It can change your network environment. Now let's talk about these devices a little bit. Um, your IPS IDS may be a software package that runs on a computer that then has 
agents that can get installed on your servers or your workstations or your firewall or your switches or wherever. Uh, it may actually be a physical device that traffic comes in and out of. Um, different ways that these can be done. I kind of like the idea of one that just monitors multiple different locations rather than traffic just coming in. Now, just coming in and out of it. The other thing I want you to see, though, I've put this inside my local network. Some people are going to want to put it in here as well, which would be great, right? If you're going to get attacked, uh, your public-facing devices are probably going to be the first ones to suffer some kind of attack. That would be great. Some people I know have actually put their IPS IDS system outside of their firewall. So the idea here is if your firewall stops your attack, you don't get notified about it by your IPS IDS if it's behind your firewall because it never sees the attack. It was blocked by the firewall. Some people have a different perspective and they say, you know what? I want to see this I want to see people uh, attacking me even if they don't get past my firewall. So they'll put an IPS IDS out here or they'll maybe put a sensor on the firewall. But they want to see that even if the firewall stops it, they want to know that it's happening. It's kind of early alert. Let me see this early on and then maybe I can respond to it before it becomes a problem. So that's your IPS IDS. Yeah, another thing that I really like is the use of a WSA, a web security appliance. Now, a WSA, it's sometimes also called a web firewall. Um, you've got a couple of different types of them. You can have a pass by, which is kind of what's pictured here, right? So this can be on a monitoring port and it can see all traffic from all of your clients or your servers that are going back and forth to the internet. And so it can monitor that traffic and you can use you can blacklist sites, you can whitelist sites, you can uh, do some content filtering. So there might be certain types of content that you don't want in a professional environment. You might want something that's going to block inappropriate sexual content or, you know, whatever, whatever your policies are. But the other thing it's going to do is it's going to look for farming sites. It's going to look for uh, maybe do a lot of ad blocking um, and then things that come across. So ads that pop up and say, oh my gosh, you have this horrible thing. You have to download the software right now to fix your computer. Okay, It's going to block some of those things. Um, it's going to block people trying to download Trojan horses and other types of malware. So a WSA can be very, very effective. Now, in a pass-by environment, what happens is it monitors this traffic. And if it sees something it doesn't like, it can send a reset signal to whatever the Internet-based host is and to the local host. That's one option. Another option is a pass-through filter, where it would sit right about where this IPS IDS is. So information comes in and goes out. Now, the advantage, if this thing goes down, because it's passed by, it's gonna, it goes down, internet browsing continues as normal, but now it's not protected. If you have a pass-through filter, where cable comes in, from the internet, cable goes out to my local network or vice versa. Um, I allow traffic in and out, but it's got to go through the device. I can set it up so that if the device fails, it does what's called a fail closed. Now, a lot of security devices, you'll have two options. You can fail open or fail closed. On a fail open, it says, you know what, I'm not functioning, just whatever, keep working. Maybe I'll come back at some point. And it allows things to just go, but in an unprotected fashion. A fail closed, um, if it goes down, it shuts everything down. For example, um, I used an ESA once that was configured to fail open. Um, and we used, we did a lot of spam filtering. It actually failed, but when it failed, it failed open. And literally, I had people in my office within five minutes saying, hey, what's with all the spam that we're getting? In a fail closed environment, it just fails closed and then nothing ever happens, right? No email comes in, no email goes out until we get that fixed. And when we installed that system, they wanted a fail open environment. After they'd seen what happens in that, management said, hey, you were right, let's go to a fail closed. And so we reconfigured it to a fail closed. 
All right, so we have the firewall, the IPS, the IDS, the ESA, the WSA. Another thing that we will use sometimes is going to be a AAA server. And that's going to be AAA stands for author or authentication, prove you are who you say you are, authorization. Now we know that you are who you say you are. This is what you're allowed to do. And accounting, this is what you actually did. So we'll use a AAA server sometimes, like Radius or TACX or something like that, to authenticate users, VPN users. This is a very common use of AAA server. People accessing uh, some of our network devices, like logging into Manager Firewall or a switch or a router. Um, we'll use AAA servers for that. So that provides better authentication for your VPN or for your devices. And then the last thing here is host-based security controls. Now, this is things sitting your anti-malware software, your local firewalls that are sitting on your uh, end devices. Now, this raises a question. If I already got the firewall, the IDS, the IPS, the ESA, the WSA, why on earth do I need security controls on my individual devices? And the answer is this. It's our best practice. It's defense in depth. And what we mean by that is don't rely on one solution. If that solution gets defeated or goes down, we have a problem. We want defense in depth. We want multiple solutions. We want a layered approach using multiple overlapping solutions. We want anti-malware here and here and here. We want it everywhere. We don't want it in just one place. We want firewalls controlling traffic here and here. We want them in multiple places, not just one place. That defense in depth really helps add extra layers, no pun intended, of security to your network and are really, really helpful. So there you go. Some basic ideas for network security devices. Now, the question that often gets raised is, okay, in my environment, what should I use? Great question, and there is no one-size-fits-all answer. So the more secure a system is, the less usable it is. The more usable it is, the less secure it is. So that's a trade-off we have. So in your environment, what's more important? The other thing is a lot of these security devices cost money. Okay, so the question is, how much risk are we willing to accept versus how much money are we willing to spend, right? It doesn't make any sense to put a $20,000 lock on a garage to protect a car that's maybe worth 1500 bucks. That doesn't make any sense. It does make a lot of sense to put a $20,000 lock on a garage that has eight brand new Lamborghinis in it. So, the types of devices and how aggressive we're going to be with network security depends a lot on our environment. The key thing is if we don't do the security, that means we're accepting the risk of something bad happening. And like we talked about in a previous video, some of these network attacks can end up destroying our organization. It's happened before. It'll happen again. So security, there is no one-size-fits-all solution with security, but it's definitely not an area that we can ignore. Even a small organization can really benefit from a good firewall, from ESAs, from WSAs, even if we're hosting uh, things somewhere else. Having some of these uh, security controls and protections in place can be really, really beneficial no matter what our organization is. How aggressive we go with it, how big they are, how robust those solutions are, that's going to depend on a lot of factors. So make sure you think through. And then if you're not on the upper management team, if you're on the technical team, your job is to talk to management about the risks and say, this is what we would recommend doing. Um, and recommend big don't recommend small recommend big say this is what we recommend doing. this is class a this is best solution we think for our organization and if you guys aren't willing to spend the money on it that's fine we get that we understand we can pull it back but realize for everything we pull back 
we're adding in potential risk? Are we willing to accept that risk or would we rather spend the money to not have as much risk? Okay, hopefully this was helpful with giving you some ideas about different network security devices and uh, some principles for securing your network.